here on the panel with is Maria Razumovska. Um, her paper is entitled Maria Yudzima and the Ungendering of, Vul of Vulnerability. Thank you very much. Um, and again, for me, again, it's just a huge privilege and pleasure to be able to participate, well, a bit virtually. Um, and I'm going to subject you to some piano playing, which I apologize if it doesn't quite work over Zoom as it should do in a room. Uh, but to, to start off with, what I would, uh, oh, I cannot, Stop screen share. Could I, could I be allowed to share my screen? Thank you. Um, uh, just to start off with, um, it would seem like the idea of killing Stalin would be a role that pretty much should attract a lot of uh, candidates. And, and to think of a pianist, and of all pianists, someone hardly known in the West, uh, to take on that is quite staggering and uh, immortalized here on film. The recording? Just had to get a, a new sleeve. And a white one. The delay has been locked. I wish to convey a special message from my heart. I wish to convey this recording to Comrade Stalin. I want Comrade Stalin to know the full intensity of my feelings for him. No, this is unauthorized narcissism. No. <laughs> the item is a. What? Comrade Stalin to know the full intensity of my feelings for him. No, this is unauthorized narcissism. No. <laughs> the item is now in my possession. After a significant delay, note the time. Took you so long, you fucking walk here. <laughs> Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin. You have betrayed our nation and destroyed its people. I pray for your end and ask the Lord to forgive you. Tyrant. <laughs> and so the end of uh, the dictatorship, all caused by one pianist or so it seems. Um, it's drawn not in, entirely from fiction, it is drawn from the uh, Shostakovich testimony. But even without the myths added on from Shostakovich testimony, uh, the idea of Eugenia and violence were never really that far away. Um, not in the iconography, for example, and not in the retelling of her narrative through people like Svetoslav Richter. Uh, so for Richter, he always said that he was left her performances with a crushing headache, that her aggressive acts on the stage um, uh, as a performer were enough to kill the listener. Um, and he also recalled that she was quite ostentatious, wandering around with a revolver, and she would show it to all and sundry. It was a bit much for me, but she'd say, hold this thing for me, but be careful, it's loaded. Always one for backhanded compliments. Richter Riley suggested that the greatest impression, however, that he had of Eugenia's violence, both as a pianist, but also as an interpreter of a score, came from her playing of Schubert's final sonata, the B-flat, D960. Uh, he charmingly managed to note that for a female pianist, uh, he was surprised that her interpretation could actually be so arresting saying that most female pianists would play Schubert with all the right niceties and he would just yawn and walk out. However, he did immediately go on to qualify this by claiming that the Schubert that he heard from Judina was not the Schubert that it should be. In fact, it was not Schubert at all. So internationally, it's really Richter's 
uh, interpretation of Schubert's D960 that has held the banner for opening up a new layer of or, or a new depth of profundity in the composer's work. Uh, it was held even by Glenn Gould as the phenomenon that finally made him fall in love and uh, understand Schubert, so it actually started to make sense to him. And for most people thinking about Schubert in Richter's fingers, it's perhaps notorious for its infamously slow tempo. Uh, even within the Soviet Union, it was almost uh, a, a standing joke that if you were going to hear Schubert play, um, Richter play rather, Schubert's last sonata, be prepared not to go home until the early hours of the morning. So he added almost uh, 11 to 12 minutes to the standard half hour playing time that would have been acceptable at that time. And there are plenty of reasons and uh, ideas of why that might have been. But if Richter's apparent uh, eccentric interpretation is seen as a beacon of genius, the idea that he's managed to slow down the tempo in such a way that it provides new insights into the work that had eluded people like even Glenn Gould, um, the reception of, of Eugenius' interpretation tends to oscillate somewhere between the ramblings of a self-indulgent religious cult figure and perhaps some accidental inspiration of someone who is prone to lunacy. In this presentation, um, I'm going to leave Eugenius' religious imagery aside, although it's very fascinating to have a look at how it derives from Florensky and would have linked wonderfully to some of the earlier papers, um, just for lack of time. But I would like to share a few impressions of how perhaps there is a lot to, more to her as a musician than the monstra sacra that the myths uh, propagated, for instance, by Richter seem to make allowances for. And at the center of this discussion is going to be the idea of positioning Schubert within the Russian definition of romanticism and what Udina's interpretation of Schubert can illuminate for us in the change in how Romanticism was portrayed and defined. To begin that discussion, I just need to hark back a little bit earlier to Schubert in the 19th century, literally to the roots where she is coming into Schubert, um, and maybe slightly before. So the circle of Stankiewicz in the 1820s, 1840s, saw Schubert as a figure to be idolized. Nikolai Stankiewicz apparently nearly lost his mind by a chance encounter of hearing Earl Koenig in 1835. And he later placed the song Atlas Doppelgänger and Amir from Schwanengesang as the epitome of all great art. So Schubert really had a huge place amongst the Russian intelligentsia, the middle of the 19th century. Stankiewicz's circle held that if Schiller led us to understand Beethoven, then Goethe, Heine, and the German Romantics have opened up our path to Schubert and the ability to call him truly ours. One of the first stage performances of Schubert to leave a deep mark in Russian culture after the Viennese tour of the tenor Hermann Breiting in St. Petersburg's German theater between 1837 and 1841 was um, the opera singer, opera soprano, Sabina Heinefetter. And she sung in 1841 already, the Vandera. And it became a very iconic piece of music for Russian culture. Uh, there are quite a few wanderers floating around. So just to remind what this one is. Oh, 
I'm going to ask you to keep that melody at the back of your mind for later on. So the wanderers songs Kitalis or later um, as it was later called actually was given the nomic of Sabina's song in, on, in honor of that of her actress. Everyone in Russia would actually call it Sabina's song. And it was immortalized in literature by Lermontov. Wider in the field of literature, Schubert uh, left a deep mark in the works of Turgenev. He left also a deep mark in the works of Dostoevsky, Chekhov and Tolstoy. And if we look into the Silver Age, uh, Mandelstam and Pasternak also code in Schubert into their own poetry. So there really is something about the figure of Schubert that's sitting right at the heart of this interdisciplinary intelligence that's very characteristic at this turn of the century. The second part of the 19th century uh, saw the championing of not just Schubert's songs, uh, but Schubert works, the operas and the symphonies through the two Rubinstein brothers and the work of the Russian Musical Association. Schubert's godlike status encompassed his entire uh, instrumental over it. There were evenings dedicated entirely to his work. In the 1870s, Tchaikovsky was writing uh, articles entirely dedicated to the work of Schubert. So the, the, the musical momentum to see Schubert as a really important figure didn't need much encouragement or fans to keep going. The 1897 Schubert centenary was marked not only in St. Petersburg in Moscow, but even in the peripheral towns, uh, including Odessa, Baku and Kazan. So that, that again is more evidence just how important Schubert is to the very psyche of this uh, interdisciplinary community of the Russian intelligentsia. At the twilight of Imperial Russia, the championing of Schubert really falls into the hands of the House of Song and Mayim uh, and Dalgame. And there, the emphasis on translating the poetry into uh, Russian is very important. Uh, again, to show that there is an element of this is ours in some way, to, this is an integral part of the culture of the time. And throughout all this, the idea of melancholia and vulnerability are highlighted as the very distinctive features of Schubert's music. It was human, or perhaps the very essence of what it means to be humanism. So uniting all of this adoration for Schubert is the profound Germanic orientation that was underpinning the intelligentsia outlets at the time. And in the Soviet Union though, that rhetoric suddenly changed. The meandering melancholia of Schubert became seen as a very negative trait. Uh, it became linked to a sign of weakness. Uh, the signs and symptoms of this weakness would be the unsuccessful piano sonata structures, for example, uh, the long meandering lines that have no purpose and no meaning other than self-indulgence. And this idea of uh, the, the lyrical meandering has been a direction of thought that has been very much studied in Western musicology and specifically the Victorian effeminate image of Schubert. But equally, that trace somehow feeds into the historical narrative of what's happening in the Soviet Union. Uh, right. As Pauline Fairclough has already talked about in, in her book Classics for the Masses, for example, um, there is a big drive to see Beethoven as a canonical hero. And of course, every hero needs an anti-hero. And in that way, understanding how Beethoven is the ultimate romantic requires a sort of a fake romantic to go along with it. So uh, Lunacharsky in his article 1928, Romantica writes, in my opinion, it is impossible to deny the romanticism in Beethoven, but only Beethoven's romanticism is that of bellicose progressives. The romanticism of later composers, including Schubert and Chopin, offers a transfer into romantic despondency and pessimism. So the idea that romanticism has split into two, that Beethoven somehow emphasizes the heroic nature and Schubert, of course, is emphasizing all the negative aspects of wallowing in sort of self uh, de depression and vulnerability as the other. And despite that negativity being attached to uh, Schubert's status, however, it is important to note that at the time, Kansas weren't very keen to let go of Schubert after having such a cult godlike status for him. And pianists like Sofronitsky, who themselves see themselves as, as wanderers and, and as late romantics, continue to worship Schubert 
the meandering lines uh, become a challenge to create unity. The romantic Byronic hero uh, as, as an introspected person who's grappling with the line of thought and expression becomes a test for many of these late wandering romantics. And here it supports most Sopranitsky's interpretation of Schubert's last piano sonata was seen by many as a pinnacle of that kind of romantic musicianship. Uh, the idea that when, when he played uh, the music, you would get a, a, a way of performing that tries very much. Sorry, I'm trying to multitask and can't find where the camera's going. Uh, His, his tempo is, is very much about trying to create that unity. They're only momentary lapses in a particular narrative. And of course, as a genius interpreter, you should be able to let it all hang together, much in the sort of post Wagner idea of, of, of unity despite things coming into your part. As a positive trait, however, related to Schubert in the Soviet Union, was attached this idea of coziness and coziness as a model of uh, democratic Soviet composition. So Schubert retained his grip very much not as a serious composer who could tell us about the world view of things, but as a composer suitable for education and culture. And the idea of, of course, uh, oops, uh, socialist realism and the idea of family and the idea of the female taking on the idea of culture and teaching culture, in this case to orphan children, is something that is very strongly part of that narrative. So, the easier Schubert works, the impromptu, the mosaic-like works, become staples and even stereotypes of feminine pianism. And it's a stereotype that lasted well into the 90s through lots of uh, disparate uh, professors at various conservatories. Now, what Eugenia does in her playing, though, is undermine that mainstream idea of the romantic narrative to Schubert that is set up, for example, by Sofronitsky. Um, what she says is that what I want to affirm is Schubert's realism and all great art needs to be realistic. It's a citation that you could almost take word for word from Pasternak when he's relating it to the gospel and the idea of romanticism as a religion. And crucially for Pasternak, as for Alexander Bloch, the idea of romanticism, because it was related to religion, is not a historical feature. And this is a viewpoint that she emphasized in her romantic lectures in the 60s. So in the Soviet championing of, of Beethoven, Shakespeare was very closely aligned to him. What Udina does is align Shakespeare to Schubert. And what she does by this is create a wonderful space for herself in which rather than talk about unity, the edge of historical narrative in the way Isaiah Berlin talks about it, um, we're interested in Jane Eyre because we want to know what is happening in the attic and we want to know why this is happening in the attic. We're not so interested in the present. Shakespeare were taken only with the present. So Shakespeare as the anti-romantic. Shakespeare, we're not interested what happened to the Montagues and Capulets. What we're interested in is what is going to happen right now to Romeo and Juliet. For Eudena, 
That was romanticism. The idea that you could time travel between different mosaics. So what I'm going to propose at the moment is the eccentric style that was so criticized uh, in Udina's interpretation, or at not least Richter, could be seen as her idea of repositioning Schubert as in dialogue with the composers she suggests. She says Schubert is in dialogue with Gluck, he's in dialogue with Beethoven, and in dialogue uh, with Rachmaninoff, of all people. How she starts her sonata. Uh, thank you, yes, I'm aware of time. So. said was so alien to Schubert and it's been credited to Richter. This, this very, very slow speed, already 1947, is something that Udina does and she even marks it in her Marx course for her students. But how do you have a theme that speed and yet the second theme she manages to bring up to twice the speed so that you end up with... <laughs> Interrupting trill becomes the second tempo. So, having two separate tempos, half twice as fast as the other, might seem as completely eccentric. But if we look towards, for example, Rachmaninoff, that was taken from the previous paper, it's a practice that's been part of the piano language of Udina's time. The inf well, famous prelude in C sharp minor. So not in his recording of it, but in his marked score for the Philadelphia Orchestra of it, actually has this tempo in the beginning. returning it back to the first theme is far less in eccentricity than a performance practice with a dialogue with a way that pianist had already stopped playing by that time so she's in direct dialogue introducing the wonder theme it allows her to change back through gluck of all people uh, sorry so the development she takes us back in time very much like Gluck and Orpheus. Which then in tempo, because of the way she's structuring it in dialogue with Rachmaninoff, allows her 
when you get back to what should be the beginning of the recapitulation to take on that second speed with the Wanderer song. So the entire sonata, her idea of romanticism, being able to capture genius in different time spaces and bring them together into one. That is what she said Shakespeare did. That is what she said Pasternak did. That's what she says Lermontov and all the great poets of her age were able to achieve. And that is what she said needs to be the crucial factor that allows us to reconsider this repertoire through a different prism. So hopefully you've got a glimpse of far from being eccentric ramblings of uh, a pianist who kills Stalin. There is a lot more to it when it comes to actually looking at her playing as a collage and dialogue with figures that she's respected in her life. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for that. I think this is the first kind of lecture recital that I've ever seen on Zoom um, and remarkably successful. I think. Um, thank you so much. All right, we have time for uh, one or two questions. Um, I can't tell you how painful it is. I'll just go ahead and say it never fails to. It never fails to amaze me how the nuances you you discover in Russian pianism and these characters. I my hats off. That was beautiful. I mean, not just your playing, but uh, I, I don't. I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to say I think it's wonderful. What? No, I can't tell you how difficult it is to try and play like you did yeah. because every bone. This is what we think about the to do it that way. <laughs> God. No, and yet she did it with so much conviction. It's, it's what an what an amazing person she was. It's just fascinating. Mm. So I mean that, that this thing about tempo relations is just fascinating. I I, I had no idea what a tradition that, that there was there that you're pointing to. Thank you so much. But Keenan, when if you if you look at the the Rachmaninoff Mark scores in the Philadelphia archive, um, you probably will have lots of margin notes about his tempos and the changes in tempos from his two big tours that he did with them. So I don't know if that's something you want to watch out for, but it's quite- I would love to see those. They're, I, I don't imagine they're digitized, no. I don't, well, they weren't when I was working on them. <laughs> yeah, right. They didn't even have an archivist last time I reached out to them. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to look at that. That sounds amazing. Right, um, maybe one last question. Unless we're all uh, suffering from Zoom fatigue at this point. Well, this, this is this is maybe a bit tangential, but I'm I'm reminded of um, like the piano roles of Scriabin, I guess that they where they discovered that his tempo varied like really widely. I, I mean, it might be different though because it's not maybe these clean um, relationships between tempos. It's more of a kind of um, smooth kind of um, transition between tempi. Um, but I wonder if you have anything to say about the relationship of that performance practice. I think Sofroniski also did that uh, too, between what you're with what you're talking about. I think that the Zverev plan was very much um, taught that tempo was an architecture within the music. And of course, good architecture can be hidden or it can be very obvious depending on what kind of result you're trying to create. I think, of, I mean, for, for the Rachmaninoff, I, it's, it's, I've taken sort of more simplistic um, relationships in the tempo. Of course, if you listen to him playing uh, other composers' work, you get a lot more nuance in how he builds up and, and hides those tempo relationships away from you. 
in the same way as if I could play the whole thing and sort of annotate it as, as a sort of working lecture. So you would take you 46 minutes, almost like a Richter's recording. So uh, maybe maybe a plan for a different day. Um, but it is quite sophisticated what she does do, bringing in this matilic relationship. But what was striking for me that I don't think Rachmaninoff was trying to do or, or Scriabin was ever trying to do um, is to use tempo as a way to evoke other epochs and to try and put in a, a narrative through it. So uh, taking the tempo of the wonder and making sure that, that that recapitulation is going to be the tempo that everybody recognizes as Sabina's song, uh, the wanderer. Um, uh, it, it's a very deliberate construction. And we tend to think of only composers being so pedantic, I think, about um, uh, constructing a work. And we sort of think that performers, well, maybe not everybody, I, I think I'm a bit guilty, that performers just sit there and magically produce something without actually knowing what they're doing. Uh, whereas if you look at the tradition leading up to Yudina, certainly, so through Rachmaninoff and, and Skriabin and even Richter, it's very meticulous uh, and, and quite reproducible. If you, if you can find the interdisciplinary key into it, it certainly helps. All right. Thank you so much, Maria. And thank you to all of our presenters for a really, really interesting panel. Um, we have a 10 minute break, I believe, before our next panel. So I think we should all take that opportunity to stretch our legs a bit. And I'll see you in 10 minutes.